sing some Christmas songs, be sure and watch the screen and don't <laughs> sing them like you usually sing them because they may not be on the screen. So <laughs> sing like the screen. Let's sing old little town of Bethlehem and on the second verse, let's get around and greet one another. i 
number 147, Silent Night.
137, what child is this? Oh, come 
in one heart and mind, bid every strife and quarrel cease, fill all the world with heaven's peace. Rejoice, rejoice, Well, good morning. Good morning. Good to see you on this weekend before the big weekend, I guess you would say. But uh, thank you for being in the house of the Lord. Last week, we began a series of messages, and uh, we'll follow it with this week and and next week. But uh, so many of us are familiar with the Christmas story. And which is a good thing. But I wanted to challenge ourselves and probably me as much as anybody to preach a message perhaps that uh, you have not heard that does relate to Christmas. Last week we began a series of messages called A Very Strange Christmas Story. And this is a very strange Christmas story number two. And uh, if you're here this next Sunday you will hear a very strange Christmas story, number three. All right, just seeing if you're awake. But these stories are so incredible that uh, my study has just absolutely blew me away. And I thought to myself, in putting all of this together where I could understand it, certainly maybe there might be somebody that never caught the puzzle pieces that we're going to lay out for you today. Now... What I will do for you, if you will allow me, we are going to have to assemble the puzzle pieces and you're going to have to stay up with me. So that means when you bow your head and you think that you're praying and you're sleeping, I know that. (laughs) We're not going to do that this morning. We're going to get our Bible and we're going to connect the dots so that we all can understand where we're going, all right? It's very, very crucial that you get this from the very outset because I don't want to lose you along the way. Now, I understand as, as, as when you're getting into this, here's what your thought is going to be. Where in the world is he going with this and how in the world does that tie into Christmas? I will promise you, if you will allow me, I will get there, but we will have to set the stage before we do so. Is that all right? Okay. You know this already, even if it wasn't all right, we're still going to do that, okay? Because we've got to get to where we need get to be where we need to be. So I'm going to ask if you would stand in honor of uh, the message that will follow, and I'm going to ask you to turn to an Old Testament book. I should have told you this from the outset. You'll need to blow the dust off this book. Go to the Old Testament book by the name of Micah, chapter one. Micah chapter 1. Yes, there is a book in the Bible called that. And uh, we will show you, we will lead up to a very important truth and how it does relate to us in the 21st century. I will show you this. If you have Micah chapter 1, verse number 9, I will show you an interesting statement here. For her wound is incurable, for it is come unto Judah. He is coming to the gate of my people, even to Jerusalem. Circle the words incurable. That word means sick, frail, or feeble. And this is what we're going to talk about today. Now, what you need to get this morning is, how in the world do you get Christmas out of that verse? I'm glad you asked, because we will get there. Let's, let's pray. 
Father, we are honored to be here this morning and realize, Lord, that it is not me that uh, the people have come for. Father, I'm just a vessel willing to be used of you. And Father, what we all need is a is a big dose of Jesus Christ. Father, I don't know the direction of people's lives here in this room on the inside. The struggles. The apprehensions. All of the drama that has played out this week. But I do know, Lord, you do know the answer to our lives. And it is found in Christ and Christ alone. Father, I have prayed over this message. I've cried over this message. I have labored over this message because, Lord, I realize how important this is to, to this congregation. Father, I need this as much as anybody in this room. And I honestly pray that I would not do anything or say anything that would be distracting from you. Pro Father, I pray that you fill our hearts with your goodness. And Father, I ask that we will be able to push things away that maybe the activities of the afternoon that we could focus just for a few, mo few moments on these beautiful words. God, I love you. And I thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The study before us might be considered odd, hard to grasp, and something that uh, you do not read very often. But tucked away in a minor prophet book of the Old Testament, the hope of Christmas stands bright. When you read the pages of this book, you know that hope is needed. I want to show you this. Hope cannot be measured in times of abundance, but hope is measured in times of affliction. Sometimes hope appears in strange places, for it is that what you will see in this message this morning. Some 70, excuse me, some 25 miles southwest of Jerusalem is a small village called Moresh. It would be hard to imagine that such a place would produce a mighty man of God. This humble town would produce a humble preacher. As a matter of fact, this humble preacher's name literally means who is like the Lord. This humble preacher had a good name and he lived up to it. He preached along a very, very important man in the word of God. Micah, the preacher in this message, is the one whose name means who is like the Lord. Micah preached in the villages in the smaller towns in Judah, where the prophet Isaiah preached in the capital city of Jerusalem. And I want you to tell you this. In the capital city, you see Isaiah preaching, and uh, uh, no doubt he had a tremendous ministry of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the, in the smaller surrounding areas, you had a man by the name of Micah that was preaching. Both men had important messages, but we will focus this morning on the words of Micah. Micah was no pushover. He was no candy-coated preacher. He was a true man of God. And let me submit to you this morning. We need true men of God in our day and time. We need some Micahs to be raised up. We need some men that will stand behind the sacred desk. And say, thus saith the Lord. And not be ashamed to say it. Friend, I want to tell you what's wrong with our society is the pulpits of our land. We can blame the crowds, we can blame the malls, we can blame everybody else. But when the pulpits of our land have gone silent, that's where the corruption have set in. Friend, I will tell you this morning, I submit to you, we need some Micahs in the days today. We need some men that's not going to be afraid to lift up the old black book and preach it just exactly how it is. We need men of God today. So let's construct this story before you so that you'll understand what we're talking about. Micah lived in a day where the whole nation was a very, very sick place to be. Fairness and integrity was non-existence. So I'm going to tell you, we're going to look at a bunch of verses today, and I will connect the dots if you will allow me to do so. Micah chapter 1, verse number 7. So let's begin this journey. Micah chapter 1 and verse number 7. And all the graven images thereof shall be beaten to pieces, and all the hires thereof shall be burned with a fire, and all the idols thereof will I lay desolate. 
For the gathered, excuse me, for she gathered it of her hire and of an harlot, they shall return to the hire of a harlot. Where in the world is, is Christmas, preacher? Hang on. According to the prophet Micah, all of their images that they worshipped would be beat to pieces. The harlots that was desecrated, the house of God, would be burned with fire. In that day, part of the false religion would be given gifts to the temple prostitutes in their worship. God said that their money would be taken by their enemies instead. Micah was a man on a mission to say exactly what the Lord desired. And can I tell you something this morning that I'll tell you with a broken heart? There are some messages that I have to preach from this pulpit, quite frankly, that simply breaks my heart. There are some messages that I would choose rather not to preach. But by the grace and the authority of the Word of God, I must preach. There are some issues that's confronting our land that we've got to get back to the Word of the living God. Now, here's what you're thinking. Well, preacher, you can't change this world. My job is not to change the world. My job is to change maybe one person in this room. If I can plant a seed in somebody's mind or in someone's heart, and if they can figure this message out this morning, and it's this, that Jesus truly is the only way of satisfaction. Friend, I will tell you, I'm preaching before a group of people this morning that has tried everything but the Word of the living God. And some of you could give testimony this morning, and you could say this, Preacher, I've tried the world. I've tried everything in it. I've, I've, I've drunk it. I've smoked it. I've put it in my body. And I'm telling you this morning, preacher, it does not work. I'm telling you there is hope in the midst of darkness. And the hope is Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, friend, I want to tell you, this is the message that Micah was preaching. Now, I want to tell you this. I have a grandson named Micah, thank the Lord, and, and, and I thought this book might be something I ought to look into. So I started looking into it verse by verse and page by page, and out come this particular message. And it was such a message that I thought, my God goodness, where has this been all of my ministry? So I wanted to share this in this day and hour with you. Turn, if you will, to Micah chapter 3 and verse number 1, and let's begin this journey. Micah chapter 3 and verse number 1. Notice what your Bible says. And I said, look at this, and I said, here I pray you, O heads of Jacob, and you princes of Israel, is it not for you to know judgment? Now listen to this. I love what he says here. Micah says that the leaders have been summoned to hear the charges against him. Notice the question that he asked. Is it not for you to know judgment? As leaders, they were expected to know the laws of Scripture. God expected them to act fairly, to protect the poor, and to deal wisely and properly. Here, here he goes on to say, you should have known what you should have preached. Listen to me. I want to tell you this. There is no excuse in today's time for a preacher to get up in the pulpit and not be prepared and not preach the word of the living God. I would be as a congregate, I would be sickened to go to houses of worship today of what they call true biblical preaching. Beloved, we don't have true biblical preaching. We have ear-tickling teaching today. I will tell you, submit to you today, there is an opportunity for teaching, but I will submit to you, there is a greater need for preaching. You see, teaching goes and teaches you how to help you. Preaching teaches you how to change. And my friend, I want to tell you, if there is a day in time where people need to grasp holy preaching, friend, it is now. And this is, uh, this is Micah's. He is condemning the leaders there. You should have known what you should have known. There is no excuse for this. Notice, if you will, Micah chapter 3 and verse number 3. Tell me if you're still with me. Amen. Micah 3, 3. Who, this is a strange verse. Who also shall eat the flesh of my people. Oh my goodness. And flay their skin from off them. And they break their bones and chop them into pieces. As for the pot, and as flesh with the cauldron. How do you like this Christmas message so far? Here the prophet Micah presents an awful picture. The leaders have become so sinful that they are pictured as spiritual cannibals. Dealing harshly with all of those that could not defend themselves. 
Friend, I want to tell you, listen to me, listen to me great. We live in a land today where we have people that's in high office, it's nothing but cannibals. We have preachers that's in our pulpits that's nothing but cannibals. Friend, I want to tell you, they're not doing what is expected of them. And shame, shame, shame. Shame for any congregation in America to put up with less than thus saith the Lord. Shame for America to put up with the sins of our nation. Shame for us to, vo- to silence our voices when voices just like ours need to be said. Amen. Shame on us that we are tempted and to back down in the corner when they slam. And, and, and slander our God. Shame on us when we don't uh, 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 go forth and say what we are to say and defend the very truths that this nation was founded on. Shame on us. We should know what we should know. Is anybody listening? Micah described them as cannibals. Wow. It gets a little bit More when he starts describing some more problems. Scan down to verse number 11 of chapter 3. Wow. The heads thereof judge for reward. Uh Uh-oh. Look at this. And the priests thereof teach for hire. And the prophets thereof divine for... What's that next word? Yet will they lean upon the Lord and say... Is not the Lord among us? Question. None evil can come upon us. Stay with me. Verse number 11 says this, that the votes of the politicians were up for sale. The decisions in the courtrooms were based on bribes or money under the table. They were destroying the poor while building their own empires. Today there's an increased hopelessness in America. The citizens realize the leaders have no answer. Our city streets are danger zones. Our schools cannot teach the basics. And can I tell you this? Judges are making victims of criminals and our courts are bent on destroying the family of the living God today. Shame on us. Micah said in chapter 1, for her wound is incurable. And guess what? The so-called reverends in Micah's day were quite comfortable with the status quo. These false ministers were bought and paid for by the politicians. Oh, it gets fun here. Somebody say amen. The preachers were bought and paid for. Guess what their message was? It was whatever the political party wanted to hear. Oh, do you think maybe we're some uh, kind of drifting towards that same kind of course? So... These preachers, oh, they had prophets in their day. They had them lined up by the dozens. The problem with them is they were on the payroll. And so whatever convenient message that the king or the, or the courts wanted them to say, guess what? Come on. Guess what they would say? Just exactly what they wanted to say. So here comes Micah. Guess how popular he was. Guess how Micah, how popular he was. He went against those preachers of the status quo. He started butting heads with those people that were on the payroll. Those were in it just for the funds. Friend, I want to tell you this. That is a very, very dangerous place in America today. Where you think that you can barter and bribe God with money. I want to tell you this. God is too holy. God is too fine. God knows our hearts. And for us to think that we can bribe God with a dime, we have got to be kidding ourselves. Especially these paid puppets of congregations today. And Micah was pointing his finger at these reverends of his day and calling them out. By the way, are you with me? I don't think that Micah made Time Magazine's cover Man of the Year. I'm just assuming that. I probably doubt that he had the leading citizens of the award, of the the year award. I, I doubt very seriously if he got many votes on that. But isn't it refreshing when you come across somebody that's not afraid to confront truth? That's not afraid to say exactly what needs to be said. And here was Micah, this man from a, from a, from an outpost of nowhere. This was a little known man. He came from nowhere. He had a big message and he wasn't afraid to preach that big message. That's the reason I love this book of Micah. 
<clears throat> Micah, <laughs> you, you've got to see this. Do, do you, want some, you want some good stuff? Look at Micah chapter 2. I am connecting the dots, by the way. Stay with me. You're saying this don't sound like a Christmas message to me. Stay with me. Look at Micah chapter 2, verse 6. Prophesy ye not. Say they to them that prophesy. They shall not prophesy to them that they shall not take shame. <laughs> Micah was saying this. Listen to this. You so-called reverends, you're preaching at me, but you don't preach at them. Come on, you're, you're coming down hard on me when I'm not the problem. The problem is the sin of the country, but you're preaching at me. I love that guy. The only thing these wicked reverends were willing to condemn was a God-called preacher that condemned sin. These cor corrupt men said something in that I thought was very, very outstanding. Do not my words do good to them that walketh uh, uprightly, Micah 2, 7. They were telling the people that God loves them and that God would never judge them. It sounds like a message straight from Houston, Texas. You probably know who I'm talking about. Don't worry about it. God <laughs> loves you. God will never send anything bad to your life. All you got to do is trust me and I'll smile all the way to the bank. Wow. No wonder Micah had a broken heart. He preached a very unpopular message. Not only did he condemn sin, he condemned the leaders and watch this. He condemned the reverends of the day. Wow. Is anybody getting this? Wow. So, his sharp words were for the whole nation, not just for the sum. Micah 2.8. I'm getting there. Stay with me. I thought this was very interesting when I started looking at this. Micah 2.8 Even of late, my people has risen up as an enemy. Now watch this statement that he writes. Ye pull off the robe with a garment. Watch this. From them that pass by securely as men averse from war. I did not know this, so let me show it to you. Micah preached that that the uh, no the enemy would pull off the robe with a garment. What does that mean? Listen to this. The robe referred to was an outer garment, and it symbolized dignity worn by Hebrew men. You remember when Joseph's brothers stripped away his coat? In other words, they stripped away his dignity. These men in Micah's day were willing to destroy a man's dignity. To make a dollar. They would cheat widows. They would rob the poor. And they would take all their meager possessions. Because as chapter 1 says. For her wound is incurable. Look at Micah chapter 3 and verse number 5 if you would. Thus. I love this. Thus saith the Lord. Here we go. Thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that make my people err, that bite with their teeth and cry peace, and he that putteth not into their... Look at this, look at this. And he that putteth not into their mouths, that even prepare war against them. Now, I want to describe a scene before you. Are you ready for this? Just look like you're ready for it, amen? Because I learned this. It was customary in the Old Testament times to give a gift to any seer or it would mean a preacher when you would consult them. Soon that custom was abused. So a wealthy man with a better gift 
would get a better blessing than a poor man. Are you following this? Oh, that was a nice little racket. If someone would give the reverends a good bite to eat, he would respond. If they would set a meal before these reverends, he would respond with the blessings of peace. And if someone would not do that or not give them a proper meal at what they thought, then these good reverends would curse that individual. One commentator said it like this. What came out of the mouths of those false prophets depended on what was put into it. Now let's start getting to the root of the whole matter. Look, if you will, at Micah chapter 3, verse number 6 and 7. What a Christmas message, preacher. Good night. Therefore, night shall be unto you, that you shall not have a vision, and this shall be dark unto you, that you shall not divine. And the sun shall go down over the prophets, and the day shall be dark over them. Then shall the seers be ashamed, and the diviners confounded. Yea, they shall cover their lips. Look at this, look at this. For there is no answer of God. There was a day when the prophets had received divine messages long ago, but now darkness was over the land. There would come a day when the ministers would seek the Lord, When the people would need the Lord. But the Bible says in the last part of verse number 7. There is no answer from God. Would you look up here and let me give you just a little solution here. When you and I continue to kick God out of everything. When you and I continue to kick God out of all vestiges of our society. When he's not welcome in our courthouses. In our lands, in our homes, and even in our churches, God forbid. Then there's going to come a time when you're going to need an answer from the Lord. And he's not going to. Not going to answer. It's not because he didn't want to. It's but because we have forced his hand by our ungodliness. So here is Micah preaching this unpopular message. Can I tell you this? If Micah come and preach this message on the courthouse steps of any any locale in America, he probably would be arrested. Nobody wants to hear this. Nobody wants to hear their sins. Everybody wants to be told, you're good. Everybody wants to be told, you're on your way to heaven. Everybody wants to be told it is okay. You can be just like you are. You come to Christ just like you are, but Christ does the changing. Micah was a true man of God. He was preaching, no doubt, when he would preach these words, his heart was broke. We have learned that the whole land was corrupt. Their leaders were vile and wicked, taking advantage of the vulnerable. The merchants cheated the poor. The preachers were preaching false messages, and the whole land was incurable. Micah was so unpopular because he preached about the God of judgment, the God of jealousy, and the God of justice. Now you will see some interesting verses. If you're still awake, I want you to notice chapter 3 and verse 12, and I want you to put your finger there. Because this verse will come to play 100 years later. Chapter 3 and verse number 12. This same verse will come to play 100 years later. Therefore shall Zion your sake be plowed as a field. And Jerusalem shall become heaps. And the mountain of the house is the high places of the forest. So what about that verse? I will get back to that in a minute. But now, let me get to Christmas. Are you ready? Well, you say, after all of that, who wouldn't be ready? Let me give you Christmas from Micah. Turn, if you will, to Micah chapter 5. And verse 2. But thou, Bethlehem, Euphrata, 
though thou be little among the thousands of Judah. Yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be the ruler in Israel whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Notice the very first word of that verse is the word but. Micah takes them to the most unlikely of villages, a town five miles from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. Micah preached, hope would not come from his generation. Hope would come from the future Redeemer of all mankind. Jesus, the King of Kings, would come and be born. And he would be holding to no earthly entity. This little baby in Bethlehem would come to set things right. My friend, that is the Christmas story. Ah, but you say, there is the rest of the story. Let me show you this. I wanted to know what happened. You do not find out what happened in Micah. You've got to go 100 years into the future to find out what happened. So what? I'll show you so what. Go, if you will, to Jeremiah chapter 26. And let me show you what happened 100 years after Micah preached. Micah chapter 26, verse number 18. Oh, look what it starts with. The same Micah we preach this morning. Look what Jeremiah was saying. Micah prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Now, Micah, remember, Jeremiah is speaking this 100 years later. And spake to all the people of Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord. Uh oh, look at this. I told you this. Do you remember in Micah 3.12? Look what Jeremiah says. Zion shall be plowed like a field. And Jerusalem shall become heaps. And the mountain of the house of the high places of the forest. Think about this. I love this. Are you ready for this? This is the rest of the story. 100 years after Micah said what he had to say. His words were still having an impact. Wow. If any preacher ever preached, I will tell you this. It's my desire when God calls me home that someday maybe there's been a word said from Calvary Baptist that's been implanted in your heart that will last long after this preacher's dead and gone. I would pray that one day there would be a man of God in this room that would rise up and say, I will take his place. I will preach the uncompromised message of the Lord Jesus Christ. One hundred years later, Jeremiah the prophet quoted him exactly and told them exactly what Micah said. But here is the kicker. Are you ready for this? After Micah preached what he preached, King Hezekiah got word. And King Hezekiah said, Oh, 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 oh. In Micah's day, because of his strong preaching and his strong stand on the word of the living God, Micah lived to see a revival. Amen. Micah lived to see what God would do when a preacher shot it straight. And then 100 years later, uh, Jeremiah is quoting him exactly. Wow. What an impact. You see, God put off the judgment of Micah because the king repented. Now, Jeremiah is saying... Look, Micah preached this. They got right. And it's time now, Jeremiah is saying, for you also to get right. But the Christmas message is this, that Micah preached Jesus. Listen to me. That is still the answer today. 
When you preach Jesus, when you uplift Jesus, that is still the answer. It is not a answer. It is the answer. And I love Micah. He preached it straight. And even a hundred years later, they were still talking about his message. Listen, it's been over three millennial since Jesus walked the face of the earth. And we are still talking about his message. You see, his message has made an impact. His message is still changing lives today. Maybe there's somebody in this room that needs a life change. Maybe there's somebody in this time right now. Even we're so far from Micah's day. So far from Jeremiah's day. But the truth is the truth regardless of who says it. And it's Jesus the Redeemer. That, my friend, will always be the Christmas message. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you, Lord, for truth. Thank you for men who's not afraid to tell the truth. Oh, Lord, we look forward. We look forward and hasten to the day when you call us home. But, Father, until that time comes, there's more living that must be done. There's more decisions that must be made. There's more lives that need to be changed. Father, in this very room, there is possibly somebody that is involved in a situation right now that they know they need to get out of. There is somebody in this room right now, Lord Jesus, that could be involved in a host of other things that even now, Lord, you are squeezing them and convicting them. Father, I pray, not my words, but your words be done. Father, we stand in awe and reverence of the blessed King of all kings. Father, the message that Micah preached all those years ago about Jesus is still the message we preach today. Please. Lord, if there's somebody that would be willing to call out to you, I would pray this would be that day. In Jesus' name. Brother Randy, would you sing this first verse? Would we stand in honor and reverence of the King?